Hi everyone. So I've noticed that a lot of people are kind of fuzzy on Darwin's theory of evolution and common ancestry and how this relates to how we go about classifying organisms. So back in the 1700s, Linnaeus uh, recognized that he could classify organisms into groups within groups, which each group being defined by a set of shared diagnostic features. So for example, he recognized a group called the vertebrates, which all shared the feature of having an internal skeleton, and he could subdivide the vertebrates into five distinct classes. So for example, he recognized a class called mammals, which were characterized by having internal skeletons, they're warm-blooded, breathe with the lungs, they produce milk from mammary glands, they have hair, two pairs of limbs, and they give live birth. Now, you'll notice that there's an asterisk beside give live birth. Well, why is that? Well, the reason for that is because when we got down to Australia and discovered the platypus and echidna, it turned out that they laid eggs. So, what do we do then? Do we create a new class to encompass the platypus and the echidna? Or do we just extend one of the existing classes and maybe drop a feature or two to encompass them? Well, the platypus and the echidna both have hair, they both produce milk, and they're both warm-blooded, so they clearly link to mammals, but they have this one feature that sets them apart. So what did we do? We just extended the definition of mammal to encompass them by saying that mammals only usually give birth and that there are exceptions to this. So in Linnaean taxonomy, when we find something that's a little bit of an outlier, we can go ahead and extend the definition a little bit to encompass that outlier rather than creating a, a brand new taxonomic group. Now, Linnaeus did not offer an explanation for this grouping. He didn't know why life seemed to fall into this pattern. Uh, it wasn't until the 1800s when Charles Darwin came along uh, that he offered an explanation, and his explanation was quite simple. So uh, here are some finches that Darwin found on the Galapagos Island, and he found that they all had all sorts of differences, all sorts of different ad adaptations, uh, and that they could be grouped together. So there were the warbler finches, there were the tree finches, there were the ground finches, and there were subsets of the ground finches, the cactus flower finches, and the seed eaters and such. Um, but uh, he constructed a very compelling argument that all of these finches were descended from a single ancestral species of finch. These are all different species of finches. Um, that they're all descended from a single ancestral species that had come over from the South American mainland. Uh, and so this kind of gave Darwin an idea. Hey, these things fall into groups within groups. And the reason that they do so is because of the branching pattern of their ancestry leading back to their common ancestor. So maybe this applies to all living things at every level. Maybe this uh, branching pattern of common ancestry can explain the groupings of organisms. Now, if Darwin's right, that means that the apparently distinct classes of animals today with no intermediates is just a product of extinction, and that if we could see everything that ever lived, uh, the distinctions between these groups would no longer be distinct. And so uh, if some of these groups contain members that are more closely related to a member of a different group than to other members of the same group, um, then that's when we're really going to run into a problem. Uh, so genetics reveals this branching pattern by looking at the similarities and differences uh, in DNA. And one of the things that genetics has revealed is that crocodiles share a more recent common ancestor with birds than they do with lizards. Now, if that's the case, then we're going to run into a problem when we start looking into the fossil record. And here's why. Uh, so if the crocodile and the lizard are both reptiles, and we, we consider them reptiles because of their shared reptilian features, then their common ancestor from which they inherited those features would also have had those features and would also have been considered a reptile. But that means that birds are directly descended from reptiles. But by the laws of cladistic taxonomy, which is based on Darwin's theory of common ancestry, 
evolution only produces new varieties of the same kind of animal. So you are whatever your ancestors were. So if the ancestors of birds were reptiles, then birds are reptiles. What? Birds are reptiles? Darwin, you cray cray. We can list many features that distinguish reptiles from birds. We can put any modern reptile next to any modern bird and come up with a long list of differences. So reptiles are generally sprawling. Their legs go out sideways from their body. They're plantigrade. They walk on their heels. They're quadrupeds. They have clavicles. They have no air sacs. Their bones are not hollow. They're cold-blooded. Their pubis faces forward. They have no feathers. There's no twist in their first metatarsal. Their metatarsals are separate, not fused. Their fingers are separate. They have a tail and they have teeth. I'm sure you can think of many other features that distinguish birds from reptiles. Birds, on the other hand, are erect, digitigrade bipeds with wishbone, air sacs, hollow bones, they're warm-blooded, their pubis points backwards, they have feathers, their first metatarsal is twisted so that they can grasp with it, they have a tarsometatarsus made up of fused metatarsals, their fingers are fused, they have a shortened tail fused together into a pegostyle from which a fan of feathers radiates, and they have a beak. So obviously lots of differences. But if Darwin's theory is correct, then that means that what we would expect to find in the fossil record is here we would find something that we would have no difficulty classifying as a reptile. And here we, have, we find things that we have no trouble classifying as a bird. However, as we continue to find fossils, random sampling along this branch, uh, what we're going to find is we should find a group of reptiles that has maybe just a couple of features in common with birds. And then we'll find a subset of them that have a few more features in common with birds. And a subset of them with a few more features in common with birds. So we have to extend the definition of reptile further and further down this branch. At the same time, we'll be finding birds that have just a few reptilian features that cause us to extend the definition of bird up this branch. Eventually, these two extensions of classification are going to collide. And inevitably, what's going to happen is we're going to have two species that are virtually identical that are on either side of this line. So we're categorizing one as a bird and the other as a reptile, two totally separate classes of vertebrates, the highest possible taxonomic division within the vertebrates, and yet if you actually compare them, there's virtually nothing distinguishing them, and it would be obvious that not only should they be classified in the same class, but they should be even in the same order and maybe even the same family. So, what do we actually see in the fossil record? What happens when we try to apply this definition in the fossil record? Well, do we find reptiles that stand erect like birds, so their legs go straight down from their body, and they're digitigrade, they stand up on their toes? Well, yes, we do. They're called dinosaurs. Okay, do we find a subset of dinosaurs that are bipedal, have wishbones, have indents in their vertebrae that are similar to those in birds that accommodate air sacs, have hollow bones, and also have a body form that are indicative of a warm-blooded animal, it's something that would maintain a high metabolism, and uh, perhaps we'd even find isotope ratios that indicate warm-bloodedness. Well, yes, we do. They're called theropods. So here's an example of a theropod. This one's called Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, unfortunately, this model does not include the wishbone, uh, but T. rex uh, had a furcula wishbone running across here. And actually, the first Tyrannosaurid wishbone was found here in Alberta. And it's standing erect with its femurs going straight down from its body. And it's digitigrade. It's standing on its toes. And its heel is up off the ground here. Uh, it's also got indents in the sides of the vertebrae. You can't see this uh, in, the, in the model, but uh, theropods have indents in the sides of the vertebrae called pleuroceles, accommodating the same sorts of air sacs that we see in modern birds. And also their bones are hollow. This is actually one of the ways that you can recognize a uh, theropod bone in the field and distinguish it from the bones of uh, other kinds of dinosaurs, things like triceratopses and duckbill dinosaurs, because the bones of theropods are hollow. So, okay. So do we have to start calling theropods birds? Well, no, we can just keep extending the definition of reptile. We can just cross 
these items off our list. Uh, there's still features that distinguish it from birds. So reptiles have a forward-facing pubis while birds have a backward-facing pubis. And you can see here that T. rex very clearly has a forward-facing pubis, distinguishing it from birds. Now here's another animal called Velociraptor. Now clearly it has the same overall form of a theropod. The skull is very similar and full of similar teeth. Um, so we would go ahead and classify this as a theropod dinosaur. However, if you look closely at the pelvis, you can see that the pubic bone is angled backward like it is in birds, rather than forward like it is in Tyrannosaurus. Well, no big deal. We can just go ahead and cross that characteristic off our list and classify Velociraptor as a reptile. So now we have these things like Velociraptor and Deinonychus, uh, which is actually what the Jurassic Park's Velociraptors were based on, uh, that we call reptiles. Uh, so now what do we have for birds? Well, we look in the fossil record and we see Archaeopteryx. In fact, the first Archaeopteryx was described just two years after Darwin published The Origin of Species. Now, clearly this animal is a bird. You can see unambiguous, asymmetric flight feathers coming off of its arms. So it has wings, lift-producing wings. And in fact, these feathers are indistinguishable from the feathers of modern birds. So clearly, Archaeopteryx is a bird. Now maybe it has some oddly reptilian features, claws on the wings, it's got teeth, it's got a long bony tail, but you know, we see claws on the wings in some juvenile birds, like the Hawatson, and we see uh, that there are tails in the embryos of birds, and they only later turn into a pigostyle. So, you know, we only have to extend the definition of bird just a little bit to accommodate Archaeopteryx. So, uh, we'll cross the beak and the pigostyle and the fused fingers off the list. Also, the metatarsals are not fused in Archaeopteryx, so we can go ahead and cross that off our list. But we still have features that distinguish them. Uh, the twisted metatarsal one, so uh, the toe back toe on Archaeopteryx is uh, opposed, so it can grip, whereas on Velociraptor, it's not. Well, that's what we thought until the Thermopolis specimen gave us the best preserved Archaeopteryx foot, and we discovered that actually the metatarsal on the first digit is not twisted, that th this toe on Archaeopteryx is more like that of a Velociraptor than a bird. And in addition to that, there is also a high articular surface on this second digit, which means that Archaeopteryx could have raised up that toe and held it straight up uh, in this manner, just like we see on things like Archaeopteryx and Deinonychus. Okay, so maybe we have a reptile-like bird and a bird-like reptile, but surely we can put these animals next to each other and still distinguish some major differences, such as, uh, well, the tail is longer in the reptile than it is in the bird, and the nose is pointier, and the arm is longer. Sure, big differences. So, uh, we can use these features to distinguish them. So, uh, Deinonychus has a long tail and has these stiffening rods running down the tail. So if we find another species of dinosaur, like this one here, Microraptor, uh, we can look at the features and see which one it more closely matches with. Well, clearly Microraptor has a long bony tail, and it also has stiffening rods running down it, which links it to Deinonychus and distinguishes it from Archaeopteryx. So clearly Microraptor, we can, we can go ahead and extend the definition of reptile from Deinonychus to encompass Microraptor. So Microraptor is a reptile. However, the fossils of Microraptor were found with unambiguous, asymmetric flight feathers indistinguishable from those of Archaeopteryx and modern birds. Okay, so the difference between birds and reptiles is uh, the difference between Microraptor and Deinonychus, which is, well, Microraptor is small and has long arms, while Deinonychus is large and has short arms. I mean, it's not like we find large, short-armed, winged dromaeosaurids. Okay. 
So obviously this isn't working. Obviously, if we start by, if we simply extend the definition of bird, extend the definition of reptile, uh, we end up smacking these two classifications together, and we end up with a class-level division between two species, which if we hadn't started from that starting point, we would clearly identify as not only being in the same class, but the same order and even the same family. So simply extending the modern definitions has gotten us into trouble. So let's now look at the whole diversity of these forms. So if we are extending these definitions, we end up calling some of these forms birds and some of these forms reptiles, even though they're virtually identical and we can't find a single skeletal feature to distinguish them. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense. But what happens if we adopt common ancestry and the system of cladistic taxonomy that follows from it, in which birds are reptiles? Well, if birds are reptiles, then all of these are reptiles. And if they're all reptiles, then we no longer have to artificially separate them. We can simply put all these skeletons side by side and group them uh, on the basis of their shared features the same way that Linnaeus did when he was starting to classify things. So when we do this, we get three main groupings. We get the Dromaeosauridae, which includes things like Deinonychus. We get the Truodontidae, which includes things like Truodon. And we get the Aviale, which includes... Uh, early birds, and by extension, modern birds. Well, this makes sense. And this looks an awful lot like Darwin's finches. So when we accept common ancestry and the cladistic taxonomy that comes from it and accept that birds are reptiles, suddenly the fossil record makes sense. And we can sort it out and not tie ourselves into some pretty absurd self-contradiction. Uh, now, when we do this, we can then ask ourselves, all right, where are we seeing asymmetric flight feathers? Well, it turns out that we see them in all three of these lineages, which suggests that their common ancestor also possessed asymmetric flight feathers, which means that the ancestors of Deinonychus could fly, and Deinonychus is actually a secondarily flightless animal. So that's interesting. We're learning some things. Now we can... Uh, now that we've adopted cladistic taxonomy, we can then put these into their larger context and look at the whole diversity of the theropod dinosaurs. We can see that there are many, many branchings of theropods, and we can recognize different clades, different groupings, like the tyrannosaurs and the ornithomimosaurs, oviraptorosaurs, etc. So we have a group that we call the deinonychosaurs, which may or may not be a natural group, uh, but it contains the dromaeosauridae and trudontidae, and then we've got group called the aviale, which uh, is the birds. Now, many people are surprised to learn that birds actually diversified uh, and led to many, many different forms, that there was actually a great diversity of birds in the early Cretaceous period, through the Cretaceous period, and that actually birds, like other groups of dinosaurs, were devastated by the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, most birds went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. Just a few forms survived and then diversified again uh, in the Cenozoic, leading to the modern diversity of birds. So uh, once we drop this distinction between reptiles and birds and adopt cladistic taxonomy based on Darwin's theory of common ancestry, um, then we can really make a lot more sense out of the fossil record. And uh, also, it tells us some pretty interesting things, such as velociraptors being descended from flying ancestors and probably being covered in feathers. So that's pretty cool.